company, Wikipedia describes you as a South African-born American internet entrepreneur. How do you describe yourself? I like to look at myself more as a global entrepreneur. Uh, I have started companies in multiple countries. I've funded businesses around the world. I've invested in, I actually can't even tell you how many countries at this point. So I just see myself as a citizen of the world. I am South African born and now I live in America. Who knows what the future holds? Maybe I wind up back in South Africa. Maybe I move to a different country. So I, I just see myself as a global citizen. Right now you are in San Diego and the newspaper headlines Television headlines, radio headlines are all around the U.S. election, 5th of November. Tell us what, in your mind, is actually transpiring. Well, the, you know, as the saying goes, the, the, the bullet missed, missed Trump and hit Biden. <laughs> so he's out. Uh, and that's thrown the entire American um, uh, electoral system in. in I, I think it's all chaos right now. I think that... that Everyone's scrambling. Uh, you know, I can give you a balanced approach. Uh, I think that there's enough people who don't want to see Trump win that I think they'll vote against him no matter what. Uh, equally, I think there's enough people who are looking at the Democratic Party and saying it's a very corrupt system where you know they they de facto just chose Kamala Harris because they kept pushing Biden longer than they they should have and instead of running a fair and democratic process within their own party. They opted to keep pushing the Biden narrative until it was very clear and obvious to everyone that, that he just couldn't function. Which begs the next question. I mean, how, how is he still the leader of the country if he can't even run for the re-election? So, uh, but, you know, whatever the, I mean, there's tons of rumors around why he stepped down, how he stepped down, who was involved, who knows? Uh, I'm not a politician, but just as someone who's watching this, um, you know, and having come from South Africa, I'm getting a little bit concerned that America's, uh, you know, not on the right track right now. What does it mean for the markets and, and specifically for crypto? I've, I've seen a number of forecasts out there that Biden and Harris are anti-crypto. I don't know if that's the reality or not. They're going to dump their holdings. You tell me what's afoot and, and whether, again, we can believe the rumors that are circulating. I think it's it's uh, as far as the current administration and what they do with the two hundred thousand Bitcoin that they're holding. Um, who knows? They've just started moving on Monday. Uh, don't know what the plans are. Trump said he wants to hold it as a strategic reserve and also accumulate more coins into the pile. Um, you know, there's still arguments on both sides. You know, on the one on the one hand, you know, people are arguing like why taxpayer money should be used to push up the price of Bitcoin. Uh, you know, for the current holders and not the benefit of everyone. Uh, it's a good argument. Um, uh, there's another argument that uh, the Democrats have that it's used for money laundering and, and illicit crimes. And that's a good argument as well. I mean, Bitcoin, I think the most uh, useful thing about Bitcoin is, to, you know, for a lot of people is evading government controls around the world and evading taxes. And so they, they, you know, that, like, that is what it's being used for. Let's just be, be honest about it. It's not being used for goods and services. Um, so there's good arguments both sides. Is it a better form of money than fiat printing? Absolutely, because you've controlled how many of these units can come out over time uh, to 21 million. So it should go up in price, um, but it requires people to buy it at higher prices. So look, it's by no means guaranteed that Bitcoin gets to some you know, unforeseen level. I say unforeseen, like a million dollars a coin. I mean, it's, it's entirely possible. So You've got a forecast end of year one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. I think double, and that forecast, is based, that forecast is based on Trump winning. I think Trump wins the election. Uh, if he doesn't win the election, I think Bitcoin tanks. Um, so the real question is where Harris goes versus Trump right now the next year or four months because the the the, the Harris Biden administration is anti crypto. They will pander to the crypto community over the next three four months to get votes, but they won't. Once they're in, they're in, and they're not going to do anything about it. They just want to nullify uh, Trump's. You know, Trump spoke at the Bitcoin conference last weekend, and he, you know, he basically riled up the crowd. He's got a whole bunch of Bitcoin supporters now voting, wanting to vote for him, and he's, uh, you know, he, he's the front runner from the at least the community because he's championing freedom and everything Bitcoin, the promise of Bitcoin offers, etc. And the, the the Biden administration is not exactly the opposite. What's interesting is. This week, they actually retracted, the AC, they got the SEC to retract their, their assault on about 10 coins, um, including Filecoin and, and a few others that are like, uh, which is, I think, good news overall. Um, but 
you know, in an election year, two or three months, you, you just try and make as many people happy as possible, whether it sticks post-election is still, still up for debate. So with all that uncertainty, is it too personal to ask you how you are positioning in terms of your crypto assets? Yeah, so, so I, I personally, um, my crypto assets are, I think, uh, at a very low level um, relative to previous years. Just because I've been you know, in for a while and I decided to diversify more and more into other things. So I, you know, I, I'm, as much as I have crypto stuff, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of it's sitting in crypto funds and, and investments in companies and whatever else. So I was, the, the day-to-day movements don't really affect me personally that much. But, but it, it sounds as though you've lost a little enthusiasm for, for crypto as an asset class with that diversification yeah. strategy there. Yeah, I have because I think there's an unlimited supply of tokens out there. Uh, it looks like a big casino. Uh, as someone who's in there from the beginning, when there was just Bitcoin now to ten thousand plus coins, it's just really hard to place bets. And unless you're in the weeds every single day working with the people, you know, it's just, it's not something which I get out of the time or inclination to do right now at, at this stage of my career and my life. So I instead of just invested in funds, um, uh, you know, I'm a like basically I'm a fund investor, so. I think yeah, I back I back fund managers to go and you know they do the work. So yeah, and then a lot of it's unlisted investments or private investments. So um, the day to day fluctuation doesn't you know doesn't scare me much. And also it also helps the long term trajectory. So let's say yeah, the long term's up. Twenty thirty. Yeah, I mean twenty thirty. I should make good returns on, on on the money over the next five, six, seven years. What it looks like in between, who knows? Ups and downs. There'll be tons of losses, tons of wins, and that's why. The nice thing about funds is they kind of spread the money across a whole bunch of investments. The ones that work are great. The ones that don't work fail, and you write them off and you move on. So I think from a, you know, also from a, um, a security perspective, I think a lot of people have seen hacks and losing crypto and whatever else. And, and I just think having a lot of exposure to to crypto assets is, um, you know, unless you know how to secure it properly, it's 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 risky, right? So you got the you got. You got any the regulatory risk that that has exactly. to come in at some stage, it's going to happen. And so, governments, regulators. So, I've just taken a I've taken a backseat to crypto uh, over the last couple of years, and I'm an observer. I I invest mainly in funds, uh, but I I pretty much sit out. Uh, I you know, I'll, I'll do a bit of crypto trading here and there, but nothing uh, nothing major. There is another data point event that is likely to influence a number of your different assets, and that would, of course, be U.S. interest rates. I see Bank of America coming out and saying December is going to be the rate, the first rate cut that we see from the U.S. Fed. Most people have factored in a cut in September, so the market is going to be hugely disappointed. Again, give me your sense. I see on your X profile, you're an armchair economist, so I'm now drawing on the armchair economist to weigh in on the U.S. interest rate cycle. So I'm in the bearish camp right now. I don't think Powell can cut rates. Definitely not today. Uh, you know, I, I don't know when this goes live, but as we as we recorded, um, you know, I, I don't think he can cut rates. I, I, I just don't think it's, a, it's an option. I think if we look at, um, uh, you know, September, I would be 50-50 at best. I wouldn't be at 100. The market's pricing at 83% as much as 100% last week. Everyone is like, you know, because here's a fundamental issue with, the, with, with, with making a move. If the Fed cuts it by even 0.25%, it's not going to make a difference, but it's going to signal to the market where the, at the end of the hiking cycle, we're now in the cutting cycle. And that can cause rebound inflation, which is what the Fed is exactly what they're concerned about, and they should be. Secondarily, they know if Trump comes in and he wins, and the stats show that he's probably got a 60% chance of winning at the, at the moment. It is dropping, but he was as high as 67%. Um, it will be inflationary for a number of reasons. Primarily, in my opinion, is the immigration stance, which is top of the agenda for the Republicans. So they're going to deport maybe a million, two million, three million, five million people illegally. They're going to stop uh, uh, labor coming across the border. They're going to lock down things. And that's going to cause a spike in inflation because by Powell's own admission at the Senate hearing or Congress hearing uh, last last month, uh, earlier this month, he he specifically said, specifically said when asked, 
that, and he agreed that illegal immigration is bringing down inflation in America. So we're bringing in cheap labor from around the world at the expense of American workers whose wages now stagnate to dr dr bring on inflation. And what's happening is, even though the inflation numbers are coming down, the cost of living is still going up because of housing and all the other expenses. So, so American workers are suffering more than anyone right now at the expense of workers from around the world coming in illegally into the U.S. and providing cheap labor, and then sending, you know, and typically sending their money back home or whatever they do with it. So it doesn't stay in the country as much. So, so this is the problem. If Powell drops rates and Trump wins, we're going to have bigger inflation problems to deal with next year. That, that, that so that's my take. If 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 Harris wins, um, and they drop rates, they're probably okay. So the question they have to ask themselves is: Are they willing to gamble? Or was really maybe is a 60-40 or even a 50-50 when it comes to uh, you know election day? Is it is it are you gambling on whether you want to have Trump win or, or or Harris win? The best move for the Fed right now is to say, no, you know we can't make a decision. We're, there's not enough data. We need more time, and then wait to December. In December they can go okay. It's the Trump administration. They're locking things down. Let's 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 just hold rates or maybe even raise rates because inflation is going to come back. Or if it's a Biden administration or rather the Harris administration continuing, um, you know, let's let's start cutting because uh, we have a, a good supply of cheap labor for years to come. That's just the way America is right now. And South Africans listening to this interview possibly now really upset that we could potentially only see a first rate cut in December because we follow the Fed so closely. But why? Interesting. But, uh, Han Yaho, I've asked him, the South African Reserve Bank governor, I've asked him for the interview. Vinny, I'm going to put it to him as soon as he agrees. It's just enabling the, you know, they're trying to enable a carry trade, which is which is not, I think, healthy for South Africa in the long term. South Africa needs to decouple from, from the US as much as possible and even the rest of the world and run a better economy, tighter, tighter, the, the, the one thing I think is about South Africa, which is really uh, you know, good, in my opinion, is that the Treasury is a very well-run organization in the country, and the debt-to-GDP levels are, are significantly better than most countries in the world. We just need to appreciate um, that we have a lot of social spending in the country that is not productive, and, we, and, and, and more infrastructural spending is required, and less red tape. And we, you know, the, a, a big problem I've had with South Africa for years is the vestiges of apartheid are still there. All these stupid systems that are in place, and you know, and, and, and hoops that you have to jump through to get things done in the country make it really, really difficult and expensive. So, I would love to see a, a South Africa where we, and maybe with this new coalition government, things are going to change. But I, I'd love to see us a, 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 a country where you can offer foreign investors better returns by not pegging the interest rate to foreign interest rates, uh, and, and and let them decide for themselves. And even if it means taking a hit in the short term. Who cares? Uh, figure that out with the treasury. Um, maybe load up on some, uh, you know, some foreign reserves if you need to. But, but the, this, this, this sort of pegging to the dollar thing is kind of stupid in my opinion. And 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 a lot of it is political because the companies that rely on on dollar income, uh, you know, and, and and trade, they're the ones obviously lobbying for it. And so I don't know. Hey, but I don't live there anymore. So. <laughs> I'm going to win when I do secure the interview with uh, the governor. I'm going to play him that little video insert from you in terms of why he needs to unpeg against the U.S. dollar, so to speak. I, I mean, South Africa could actually do a really interesting uh, job in, in building foreign reserves. And I mean, you can even throw some Bitcoin on the, on the balance sheet if you really wanted to, right? Uh, it's pegged in dollars. Uh, but it, it, it's it's... Look, I think we need to go and have a, 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 some sort of commission or a, or some sort of an advisory board to to the president, to the to the, to the powers that be that, that look at all uh, apartheid era laws around currency controls and 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 look to repeal as many of them as possible that don't make sense in the current paradigm because that's what's holding the country back. Even things like the the, the loop law, for example, where you know uh, which has prevented me from investing in South Africa many times, like. You know, just just all these stupid laws that existed because they were trying to have a protectionist economy that was isolated from the rest of the world, and those vestiges remain, and no one's actually dismantled it. Are you putting up your hand to? I know you're not based in South Africa, but do I hear a volunteer to head up the commission? I wouldn't head it up, but I definitely join and and, and mouth off in the committee. <laughs> Got you. Let me see if I can mobilize 
and and we'll have a conversation uh, around the the commission that that can change the landscape and and make South Africa investor friendly because we definitely yeah. don't want to hear of any that we, we, uh, yeah. challenges that you continuously encounter when it comes to investing in South Africa. We want foreign direct investment. We want to grow the economy. But let's move off now to uh, another part of our discussion, and that is where you are finding value. You were saying you are giving or you're looking to investments across a broad universe. I chatted to Magda Vyazichka recently, the CEO and co-founder of, of Signia, and there are a couple of themes that she's pursuing. One of them, and I'm going to put this to you, is the weight loss drug environment and whether you see that as one of the big plays for the future. So let's talk about this from two different perspectives. One is, I mean, so a lot of my investors right now are in uh, so con conscious health, and, and I try to make sure that my investments are um, centered around making the world a better place. Um, and, and, you know, across many levels. Um, I, I fundamentally am against the weight loss drugs for anyone who's not a diabetic. I think if you're a diabetic, then there's some reason for it. But I think for people who are taking it and, um, you know, using it and abusing it, you know, you can lose the weight. And I, I've got many, many friends who've taken this and they've, they've gone that route. Um, they look pretty unhealthy and they've lost a lot of mu muscle. So a lot of the science has shown that sarcopenia uh, kicks in, so basically muscle loss, and as you get older, this becomes a bigger issue, and you know, it's, uh, you know, all cause death mortality goes up when you have uh, sarcopenia, um, because I mean, you can't prevent you know fall that sort of thing. You just lose a lot of muscle, and people think, oh, it's fine, I'll, I'll deal with it later. Um, you know, the the studies, uh, uh, the clinical studies around these drugs do not uh, are, are not they're not required to take DEXA scans, for example. So. A DEXA scan is basically a full body scan, tells you what your body fat is, what your muscle is. And for uh, there's a subset of doctors who have gone and done that with their patients. So do a DEXA scan before and after. And they found that up to 76% of the weight loss was muscle, not fat. So people lost some fat, but they lost muscle at a much higher ratio, right? And so now people are like kind of skinny fat or scrawny. And I think it's extremely unhealthy for us to be tempering our bodies in this way. Um, and it leads to long-term negative outcomes. Um, so, so look to me about the conscious health theme that you brought to the yeah. fore. So I just invested in um, uh, in a fish farm um, sort of operation uh, called Seatopia, Seatopia.fish. And I was always against farm fish. And I think nobody should eat farm fish. Like, I think it's just uh, unhealthy. And, there, and there's, I'll give you the reason why. Like, when you get told to eat salmon, because um, it's got healthy fats, it's rubbish. If you're having farm farm salmon, they're feeding the salmon typically with uh, things like tuna trimmings and uh, cornmeal and dyes. The reason they add the dyes is because if you feed a fish corn, which I mean, fish don't find corn in the ocean, right? So they're weird, you know. So when you feed the fish corn, it doesn't get enough uh, acidanthin and and other colorants, and therefore what happens is the fish turns white. So salmon becomes like white, and so they have to put dyes in to make it look good. So first of all, the dyes are unhealthy. The fish are eating something which metabolically it's not meant to digest. So then you have a very much higher ratio of omega-6s to omega-3s. Omega-6s are, are inflammatory fatty acids. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. So we talk about healthy fats even you know, the, 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 for, that come from salmon. You want to get as high a ratio of omega-3s as possible, not 6s. In fact, you should cut 6s out of your diet entirely. You should take zero 6s in, uh, you know, except maybe in, in the food you're eating. But you, shouldn't, you should just try to avoid it, like no seed oils, none of that stuff. And the problem now with the fish farming world is mass fish, fish farming, it's expensive to use what fish normally eat, which is kelp. And so, so I invested in Seatopia because they basically work with farmers to only feed kelp to the fish. Now, the fish is a bit more expensive, but it's coming out. It's mercury tested, so you don't get the tuna trimmings add mercury to the salmon. So you get no mercury. We, we test some microplastics, and we... Um, uh, you know, and there's no, you know, there's no artificial dyes or anything else in it. So now you're getting healthy fish with healthy fats. Now it's available, I think, mainly in America. I think a little bit of Canada uh, only at this point. But uh, I encourage fish farmers in South Africa to contact Cetopia and maybe supply and farm fish because we buy fish from around the world now. Um, but th this is what South Africans should sort of wake up and realize is that the food system, as much as broken in America, it's broken in other parts of the world because the world has had to scale up from 
maybe a couple of hundred million people at the end of the last century or the one before, 19th century, um, and two to eight billion people. So, the, so something has to give. And what governments do is, so inflation is actually the biggest killer here. Because what happens is, and I'll give an example. So let's go, let's, let's talk about our, our, you know, no-name brand, like a, a pick and pay or checkers or whatever, right? So they're buying fish from, uh, from a, you know, some, some fish farm. And inflation goes up. And so the, the 100 rand piece of fish you were buying last, last month or two months ago, now it's 110 bucks. And, and, and that's what it costs to actually produce the fish, you know, based upon the farmers, what their needs are. They go, to the, they go to the retailers and the supermarkets, and the supermarkets are like, no, you won't put up the prices. We refuse. Like, you got to find a way to keep your costs low. So you have two, two choices. Like, as a fish farmer, you can cut your costs wherever it is, or you cut the cost of the feed. So then you switch from maybe a kelp-type feed to a, a, a corn-type feed. So now inflation is what forced uh, the farmers to go figure out how to cut costs. And the only way they can cut costs is to reduce the quality of the inputs. And so you still see the same piece of fish you saw you know, maybe a month or a year ago, but it's markedly different, and the cost has come down, and that's because of inflation. So inflation is, is ultimately killing us, in my opinion, because um, food manufacturers over decades have had to downgrade the quality of food that we're eating because costs have been rising, and inflation is happened because of government spending, and that's happened in America you know, in a big way. And so we're seeing this more and more, but, but people are getting sicker and sicker, uh, and, and there's yeah, you know, there's no reason for it going to doctors, but it's very clear why it's happening. I'm actually doing a documentary right now. So, so when is that documentary going to be done and dusted? It'll be out early 2025. Uh, it's basically on a healthy, a healthy way to live and dealing with all of these issues. One of the other issues, and I'm not sure if you're going to be touching on it in your documentary, but is water scarcity. And the the crisis that is upon us is is that something that is on your radar screen from an investment theme perspective? You know, I've looked at it. I don't think it's. I mean, it's a very localized problem, right? So, so depends on where you are. You have water scarcity issues, and then you've got filtration, and you've got purification issues. Uh, I've personally just invested in a nuclear energy company. I think energy is a bigger issue right now than 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 water. Like with enough energy, you can. Um, uh, you can you know uh, uh, you can have more clean water, right? So energy is actually the limiting factor. With enough cheap energy, uh, we can have desalination plants anywhere. You can take ocean water and you can desalinate it. So, so I don't think that water is the problem. I think it's it's cost of energy that's the issue. Absolutely. I mean, cost of energy and to start and started there as a South African. I mean, energy has been firmly uh, front and center for us, or, or lack thereof. You say uh, nuclear power plant. Are there further investments in energy and and into the renewable energy space? Um, so I mean that's my that's been my big bet in energy is modular nuclear reactors. So as an example, like you know the company invests in they if the South African government was actually just open to it, uh, they could ship fifty of these modular reactors and give a, a gigawatt of power uh, and just put it up somewhere. It's you know they've been it, it's it's so like. It's modular, so basically it's the size of a, a shipping container. You put fifty of these up on a, like some sort of an array, and um, uh, fifty are on an array, and you can provide a ton of power. But the, the biggest issue they have, which is not really an issue, but they have to get government approval. So they're working with governments around the world to get approvals for this. But if South Africa wanted nuclear energy, they wouldn't have to manufacture anything in South Africa; it would just be shipped and stored. Vinny, I know I've. I've really pushed my time with you, but I do just want to check. Are there any themes that I have uh, perhaps missed in terms of front and center that we should close out this conversation with? I don't think there's anything specific. Uh, I, yeah, I, I'm just I'm hopeful that this African economy um, with the with the coalition government sort of uh, comes together well. It looks it looks promising so far. I think there's lots of good positive changes that I'm seeing. It's going to take a while for the country to turn around, so to speak. Uh, but I think that uh, the the government should be looking at, uh, you know, de deregulating the economy. You know, because the right now the economy favors big businesses with, you know, uh, with the ability to comply with, you know, re regulations. And you try and make the small business sector grow more. I'd love to see the small business sector thrive more in South Africa. Is Silicon Cape still an opportunity for you? Um, you know, as a region, I think it's great. Uh, but I just, um, you know. Again, South Africa's got some fundamental issues. Like even when I'm down there and I'm visiting and the power goes off, I'm like, how, how do you function in this world? 
It's really, really high. It, you, and you kind of, it's a frog in boiling water. The longer you say it, the more you get used to it. And you're just like, this is normal. It's not normal to be sitting anywhere in America in a cafe and the power goes out. It's very abnormal. Um, the good news is I think South Africa has become very resilient and decentralizing the power grid through generators or whatever else. Um, so if any you know, any major crisis happened worldwide, it would probably be okay. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm, op- I'm optimistic for the long term of South Africa. I think the short term, there's a bit of a bunch of work that needs to be done. Vinny, thank you so much for your time. You've been incredibly gracious. Uh, Vinny Lingham, global entrepreneur here on Biz News. Thanks. Thanks, Marlon. Great being on the show.